We're in Ephesians chapter 2 on Sunday morning. He's been going through the book of Ephesians. And uh, we're here in chapter 2. We'll begin reading in a moment here in verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2. When you find Ephesians 2, if you're able to stand, stand with me. We'll read responsibly down to verse 10. If you need to remain seated for uh, health reasons, that's fine. Just follow along as we read. Notice verse 1, Ephesians chapter 2. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, together, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our, lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus." that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Isn't that funny how verse 9 just flows automatically <laughs> after verse 8? They just go together so well. So I appreciate you all doing that. That's fine. Let's pray together. Lord, we're so grateful for what you've done for every human being in this world. And Father, we recognize that there are many that have not recognized it yet. In fact, there was a time when we didn't recognize what you've done. But Lord, most of us, I hope all of us in this room have. And I pray that because of it, Lord, you would do something in our hearts as we read this great work that you've done in our lives. Please bless the message. I pray you'd fill me afresh and anew with thy spirit. May your word go forth with power and clarity. And again, I do pray if there's someone here, as this book is written to believers, but there may be someone here that's not saved. They're not sure that they're going to heaven when they die. I pray that today would be the day that you clear that in their minds and they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior today. But for those of us that know you, that this message would be a challenge to all of us. Please help me again as I preach. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Years ago when I pastored in Oxford... There was a church member there that got saved, like me, as an adult, and uh, he was there, and it's actually his son was in the church as well. And one day we were just kind of talking about our testimony, and he was telling me his testimony of how he came to know the Lord as his Savior. And uh, he'd mentioned to me that there was a Christian man that he had worked with for several years who tried to witness to him quite often. He did what, you know, Christians do. They invite you to church, they hand you tracts, they're burdened about your soul. And he was lost there, and uh, he was trying to give him the gospel, but he wasn't interested. He was telling me how at first, he didn't want to hear it. Well, one day they had gotten into a debate at work, you've been there in the break room, sometimes not in the break room, about religion and the Bible, and there was a Christian man, and then the man that was telling me his testimony and other guys that had worked there, and uh, they were going back and forth and back and forth with this Christian man. And the man giving me his testimony said this. He said, that, that Christian man said something to me that really got my attention. There was a phrase he used I couldn't stop thinking about. He said, it pierced my heart. And he said that it was because of that statement that he ended up finally listening to the man and getting saved. You say, what was that statement? Here's what that Christian man said to him. In the midst of that going back and forth there in the workplace, he said to this man that had gotten saved later, he said this, you're nothing more than a walking dead man. Think about that. It's a powerful statement. 
You're nothing more than a walking dead man. And by the way, that's what every lost person is, including us before we got saved. If you're here today, and I, I mean absolutely no disrespect to you, I'm using biblical terms here, and I want you to hear me out, so don't tune me out after I say this. But if you're here today and you're lost, that's what you are. You're a walking dead man. You're a walking dead man. Look at verse 1 of our text. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Look at verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins. Talking about before they were saved. Colossians 2.13 says the same thing. It reiterates the same truth. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You were dead. What is Paul talking about here? Well, in the latter portion of chapter 1, the Apostle Paul told these believers he was praying for them. He was, he was praying for them. Uh, it had been about five years since they seen the Apostle Paul. He was now under house arrest in Rome. And he's there in Rome, penning letters, visiting people. And he got word from someone, perhaps Tychicus, who's mentioned at the end of the book of Ephesians. He heard what was going on at the church at Ephesus, which he planted, by the way, on his second missionary journey. And he heard, heard some wonderful things. He heard of their faith in the Lord uh, in verse 15 and of their love for the brethren. And that prompted Paul to pray for them. He said, I got word of your faith in the Lord. I got word of your love for the brethren. And let me tell you something, believers. I'm praying for you. And his prayer is recorded for us in verses uh, 17 to 19. He prays three things for them. He prays that they know the Lord Jesus Christ better and better. That's a good goal to have, isn't it? We come to know him as Savior, right? We know him. He knows us. But that's just the beginning of that relationship. And then we should know him better and better. And he's praying that they do that. And then in verse 18, he prays that they understand his will for them in this world. That's a good thing to pray for as well. God has a will for you. He has a will for me. And he wants you to understand it. Paul was praying that. And then in verse 19, uh, that they experience his power in their lives. And not only his power in their own lives as he changes them, but also as they give out the gospel, the power that he has to change other people's lives. And then in verse 20, he mentions about this power, that this power he was talking about was the same power that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead. And then he reminds us who Jesus is, uh, and where he is, uh, and what he is doing. He went on to the end of the chapter to say that Jesus Christ is still alive. He's seated in the heavens today. He's at the right hand of the throne of God. He is far above every heavenly and earthly power that exists. And he is the head of all things. And in particular, his churches. In other words, he reminded them that, that Jesus Christ is our head. He is our authority. He does uh, is the one who is to guide us by his word and lead us by his spirit. He is Lord. But then I asked last week this. Is he your Lord? Is he my Lord? That's a different decision to make than trusting Christ as Savior. Uh, to make him the Lord of your life. That's a constant thing, by the way. You see, his Lordship in your life, his Lordship in my life, and in the life of this church, is a choice we have to make. Will we let him be our Lord? So the question is this. Why? Why would we make that choice? After all, I'm saved. I know when I die because I trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. I'm going to heaven. So isn't that good enough? It's good enough to get you to heaven. But it's not good enough to live in this world. He wants us to make him Lord of our lives. Why make him my Lord? That's the title of the message this morning. Why? Why should you make him your Lord? 
Why should I? I believe here in our text, and these are so simple, these truths are so obvious here. We see the Apostle Paul giving them three reasons why we should make him our Lord. And I hope by the end of this message, if you're saved here today, first if you're not saved, you get saved. But if you are saved, you'd walk out of here saying, you know what, I am going to make him the Lord of my life. What is the reason number one? First reason is this, here it is, because we were dead. Could we say that together? Because we were dead. Look at verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among all, uh, whom also we all had our conversation in times past, uh, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's what you and I were before Christ. We were dead. Dead, he says. So I ask, what does it mean to be dead? There's a lot of people out there that aren't saved. They're walking around. Two things about being dead. Number one, being dead describes our condition. Do you know the Bible is very clear that every human being's condition before they are saved is this. They are dead in their trespasses and sins. What exactly does that mean? Do you know the word death, biblically speaking, means this? Separation. That's what it means. You say, what do you mean by that? Do you know there's three kinds of deaths of death that the Bible refers to? First one is this, there's a physical death. I think we all get that. Uh, when you're born, you become alive, you have a body, you walk around this earth, but one day that life is going to end. By the way, it is going to end, and maybe sooner than you think. But it is. It's when, uh, and when we die, what happens? Uh, I've been in the room when people have passed on, we call it. Physical death is when a man's soul and spirit is separated from their body. I remember walking into the hospital room after my dad had passed away and I looked on his body laying there and I could tell that he wasn't there. His body was there, but there wasn't anything there. It was just his body. You see, physical death is when a person's body ceases to function. It's when they take their last breath on this earth and the spirit separates from their body and that spirit goes to their eternal abode, either heaven or hell. If you're saved, you go to heaven. If you're lost, you go to hell. Those are the only two options, by the way. That's what happens after physical death. That physical death is described for us in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. That's physical death. There's another death that the Bible talks about. And that is eternal death. That is the everlasting separation from the presence of God. That's for a person that's not saved. See, if a person's not saved and they die without Christ, they are going to experience eternal death. Uh, they will be separated from God forever, but it gets worse uh, in a place called hell. Where Mark says, the worm dieth not. Everlasting death. 2 Thessalonians 1 7 says this, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, watch this, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction uh, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That is what the Bible calls eternal death. Uh, a lost person will die physically and go to a place called hell forever and ever and ever. That's eternal death. But then there's a third death the Bible talks about. And that's what we find in our text. 
in verse 1, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And then in verse 5, even when ye were dead in sins. Spiritual death is when a man is, yes, he's physically alive, but he is spiritually separated from God. He's lost. He's unsaved. It's the fact that all of mankind is lost in their sin, separated from God, and destined for an eternal hell if he does not receive the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, we are all born spiritually dead. Every one of us. You say, how'd that happen? What do you mean I'm born spiritually dead? Why? Well, turn back with me. Hold your hand here. Turn back to Genesis chapter 2. I'm glad you asked. I know you didn't ask. So I was just saying that. Genesis 2. Notice verse 16. We know that God created man. And in the image of God created he him. In Genesis chapter 1. But then in notice chapter, but notice chapter 2. And verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. To dress it and to keep it. Watch this. And the Lord God commanded the man. Saying of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. Watch this. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt Surely die. God gave us a free will. And we chose to exercise that free will by disobeying him. Adam and Eve ignored God's warning. They chose to disobey God. And because of that, they sinned. And sin entered into humanity. And that sin was passed along to all of us. We became sinners by nature. And physical death began its process. And mankind has become spiritually separated from God from birth. And if you're a man here, mankind I mean, you've inherited that nature. Romans 5.12, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So while the unsaved person, someone who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, may be physically alive and may be mentally alive, he is spiritually dead and destined for an eternal death, and justly so, by the way. You see, being dead describes our condition. But you know, secondly, being dead is displayed by our conversation. Here's what I mean. That word dead, I mean conversation, means behavior. Notice how we're described in verse 2. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. By the way, if you don't think, if you don't think that you're a sinner, would you please for a moment take a an honest look at your life. Stop for a moment. You see, the Apostle Paul describes here all of us. Well, those are just some bad people. Wow, who's he talking about there? Boy, there's some terrible... That's you. That's me. That's who we are. You see, before Christ, that's what we do. We walk according to the course of this world. We, we, we uh, walk according to the ways of the devil, if you will. Our desires are to fill the desires of the flesh and the desires of our mind. We're not thinking about God. We're doing our own thing. We may give him a little lip service once in a while, but we do our own thing. We go our own way. Uh, we didn't want anything to do with him. We are by nature the children of wrath. That's what we were. God saves all sinners, you know. And I'm amazed he'd save a sinner like me. I remember a man singing that song long ago at a youth meeting. He said, why don't I take your finger up? And when you say, God saves old sinners, and he saved a sinner like me, and you point to yourself. I remember a lot of people uh, had problems doing that. Well, am I that bad? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. By the way, when we look out at this world, why do you think we see what we see? When we look out, we see this pleasure-mad world. 
And it's getting worse. It is a sex-seeking, lust-craving, rebellious, anti-God society that we are looking at. But you know what we should see when we look out there? Ourselves without Christ. That's us. If Jesus Christ hadn't saved us, we'd be doing the very same thing. We'd be thinking the same way. I wonder if any of us would be comfortable if our pre-Christ life would be displayed on a big video screen for everybody to see. Imagine if uh, people could see all the things we did, and let's go a step further, and all the thoughts we had would be revealed to everyone. All of us would be embarrassed. Every one of us ashamed. You say, well, that's just, you know, Paul's thought. Well, go to Romans chapter 3. I call this the humility passage. Here's God's description of us before we were saved. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Well, I'm not that bad. Yes, we are. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Whew. That's this world. And that's us. Before Christ. Now, I say all that to say this. Why is that important for us to remember? Well, why, why is he saying this? You, as he quickened and he lists that. Here's why. Because the clearer the picture we have of our state before we were saved, the greater is our appreciation of what God has done for us. Turn over, hold, hold your hand here. Turn over to Luke chapter 7. Do you remember the Lord Jesus saying this about this woman? In Luke chapter 7 and verse 44. Well, look at verse 41. Verse 40, Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. Notice, 10 times the amount. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. You see, it's a matter of perspective. If I have the idea, well, I wasn't that bad. You know, God got something pretty good here when he saved me. Guess what? I won't appreciate what he did as much as if I got the real perspective of my life. When I realize that I'm a wicked, wicked sinner, and I'm grateful for what he's done for me, that's going to change everything. You see, the reason I should make him Lord of my life, because I was dead in my trespasses and sins. I was on my way to hell. And he did something for me, which gives, brings me to point number two. So we see we make him Lord, number one, because we were dead. Can I ask you something? Do you realize what he's done for you? Do you realize uh, what he did for you on the cross of Calvary? So we see we make him Lord because we were dead. But then secondly, we also make him Lord because of what he did. I love verse four. Notice, but God. 
After Paul describes what they were before they were saved, uh, uh, how they walked according to the prince of the power of the air and all of that, notice he interjects with, so with something that changes the whole thing around. Uh, I love those first two words. But God, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, uh, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved uh, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places is in Christ Jesus. Paul reminds them of what God did for them and for us, by the way. He quickened them. That word quickened means he made them alive. More about that in a moment. In other words, God looked down upon us sinners going our own way, doing our own thing, and he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to go to the cross of Calvary so that you and I might have our sins forgiven and he would deliver us from eternal death and give us eternal life through Jesus Christ. Do you understand what he did? He brought us from spiritual death to spiritual life. Eternal life. You know, as I think of what he did and read what Paul wrote about, I see two things here. I see this. First of all, the reason. Why did he do it? Why would God do that for us? Well, he tells us. There are three words that he uses to describe the reason that he did it. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. Why would the Creator God do this for mankind who has rejected Him, has turned His back upon Him, and wanted to go our own way? Why would He care about us? I'll tell you why. Number one, because of His mercy. Our God is rich in mercy. By the way, mercy is God's exercise of pity and compassion. When he looks down upon this earth and he sees uh, us lost as sheep without a shepherd, he has mercy and compassion on us. Uh, mercy is God being willing to hold back the judgment that you and I deserve because we all deserve God's punishment. Do you know he could have let us all just die and go to hell? But he didn't. Because of his mercy. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. Psalm 103 and verse 8, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. One of the reasons that he did this was because of his mercy. But then also because of his love. Notice how he describes it, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Can you imagine? God loves every human being. I know what you're thinking. Well, I'm kind of lovable. We're, we're actually not real lovable. But he loves every human being. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I understand something. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches that our God is love. You see, we don't understand that kind of love. We love people that love us. And we love people that we like. But God loves all men. Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth or proved his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4, 9, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, uh, that we might live through him. Why did he do it? Why did he go to the cross of Calvary? Because he loves you, and he loves me. Oh, I always think of Sam Cordry when I... Think of this song, Frederick Lehman's song, penned in 1917, The Love of God. As that hymn writer attempted to 
pen with words and describe the love of God, describing something which is beyond description. He writes, could I with ink the ocean fill, were the whole sky a parchment made, every blade of grass a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though spread from sky to sky. Oh, love of God! God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forever endure the saints and angels' song. Don't ever say, nobody loves me. God loves you. So we see his mercy and his grace. Reason number three, I'm sorry, his love. Reason number three is grace. Look at verse five. Even when we were dead in, in sins and hath quit, quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved. Grace, we know, is God's unmerited favor. We didn't deserve it. We're saved by grace. Someone put it this way. God's riches at Christ's expense using the acronym grace. Uh, it, it is understand it's everything we receive for nothing in return. It is God helping the helpless. Uh, is God giving me everything for my salvation and requiring nothing. You see God saved us because of who he is. Not because of who we are. Amen. You see, we don't achieve salvation through church attendance. We don't receive salvation through trying to obey the Ten Commandments or getting baptized or observing the Lord's Supper. Uh, uh, we, achieve, we get salvation by grace through faith. We receive it by simply hearing and believing. So notice when we think of what God did, we see the reason. But then notice verses 6 through 9. We also see the result. What did God do when we believed? Verse 6, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places uh, in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding reach, riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. What is the result? Notice we're quickened. I mentioned this already. We were spiritually dead. We are made uh, spiritually alive. He gives us eternal life, never to lose it. Uh, then we read in verse 6 that he raised us up. Understand, when he saved us, uh, he did it because of his mercy and his love and his grace. And what that has produced is, uh, is a new life in Christ. Uh, he gives us new life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You see, we have God's Holy Spirit power that indwells in us. Uh, and it gives us and helps us uh, and enables us to live the Christian life. And to live no more in bondage to sin. When he saved us, he's given us a new life. Praise God for that. Does anybody want that old life back? Raise your hand. So we can all laugh. Because nobody does. You know, hold your hand here. Go to Acts chapter 19. I think they realized exactly what Paul was talking about. Do you remember when he was there with them what happened? They experienced the love of God, the grace of God, and the mercy of God. They got saved. And notice what happens in Acts chapter 19 and verse 17. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. This is in Ephesus when he had come there. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 and pieces of silver so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed these uh, people were practicing magic uh, they were getting involved in things that they should not have been involved in uh, and then they came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior when they heard the gospel they received him uh, and they were coming out of their homes with all the junk that they had the books and the curious arts they were coming in the center of their town and they piled them up and they burned them all why did they do that? Because the Lord gave them a new life. A new life. So they were quick and they ra he raised us up to a new life. Then back in Ephesians chapter 2. Notice what he says here. And he made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's present, by the way. You say, wait a minute. I'm not sitting in heaven right now. 
Do you know in a sense you are? You say, what do you mean by that? Do you remember in the Old Testament times, no one but the high priest could enter into the holy place? And he could enter into that holy place, and he did so once a year. And if you remember uh, when he did that, he actually represented all of Israel. And when he'd go in uh, on the breastplate that he wore, do you remember what was on that? Uh, were the names of the tribes of Israel that he brought before the Lord. Do you know where Jesus Christ is today? He's seated at the right hand of God. Do you know what he's doing? He's interceding on your behalf. Amen. Your name and my name is being brought before the throne of grace. Hebrews 2.17, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Jesus Christ is in heaven at the right hand of the throne of God. What is he doing? He's praying for you. He's interceding at the throne for every one of us. He is naming our names before God the Father because we're saved. You see, God didn't save us because we were pretty good people. He didn't save us because we weren't so bad. We're trying harder than most. He saved us because of who he is. His mercy and his love and his grace. That don't make me want to make him Lord. Because of what I was. I was dead. Because of what he did for me. But then there's a third thing that ought to want to make him our Lord, not only because we were dead, because of what he did, but then lastly, because of what it does. What does salvation do? Well, you say it brings us to heaven. Do you know there's more to it than that? Look at verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For, he is his, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Do you know that making him the Lord of our lives, and the head of this church, and the master of all, does two things. Number one is this, it brings him eternal glory. Again, look at verse 7, that in the ages to come. Do you know the very reason that you and I were created was to bring God glory? That's why he made us. Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And understand, the great purpose in redemption, the great purpose in Him saving us is not merely the fact that you and I have our sins forgiven and are safe from going to hell, although that's good, and we have a home in heaven secured for us. It's much more than that. You see, the great purpose in redemption is this. It brings glory, eternal glory, to God. And when you and I make him the Lord of our lives, do you know what that does? Imagine what a monument for all eternity that will be. I mean, angels and demons and the entire heavenly host will see how God has triumphed through his son in your life and what God has produced in you. You and I will be an eternal trophy of God's mercy and his love and his grace that everyone will see and marvel at for all eternity. Can you imagine that? John Newton, right? Amazing grace. Wicked sea man, ship man, slave trader, and all that. Got saved. His life changed. Lived for the Lord. Became a pastor. Served the Lord the rest of his life. It's on to glory. Imagine him in glory for all eternity. There he is. Boy, well, look what God did in that man's life. Oh, we could go down the line of all the people, the Apostle Paul. Oh, name after name. You see, when we make him Lord of our lives, understand what we're doing. It's not just, uh, salvation is not just a, a fire escape. Uh, it's going to, when we make him Lord, it's going to bring him eternal glory. But then there's a last thing, and that was this. 
it'll also give him our earthly service. You see, when he is Lord, if he truly is Lord, we won't wait till eternity to serve him. We'll do it now. And that's what he wants. Again, verse 10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Uh, yes, he saved us so that our lives would bring him glory, but then he left us here so that you and I would use our lives to serve him and to live for him. The question is, are we? You see, God has a special work for each and every one of us to do in this world. But it will never be accomplished unless we make Him our Lord. So I ask you this morning, we're done right here. Are you saved? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Could you give a Bible reason that you know you're on your way to heaven? I hope all of us would say, well, yes, oh, yes. yes, yes. But then the question, second question is this. Is he the Lord of your life? Who's directing you? Who's leading you? Who are you serving? Who are you worshiping? Who's the head of your life, if you don't mind me putting it that way? You see, if you're saved, it should be him. Because of, because of what he... What, we were dead. We were dead. We were on our way to hell, and he saved us. Because of what he did. He loved the unlovable. He showed mercy and grace to people that didn't deserve it. And because of the reason he did it, to, to bring him glory and that he might use us to reach others with the gospel in a lost and dying world. That's why. So what's it going to be? Are you going to lead your life? Or are you going to let him? I would imagine when we all get to the end of the road of our lives and we, if the Lord gives us an opportunity to stop and reflect on life and look back, I know all of us will have regrets to some degree. But as a whole, we're, we're either going to say, well, I did my best to serve him and live for him and I'm ready to meet him. Or I'm going to hang my head at the judgment seat of Christ because I live for myself. And then we have to look at him face to face. Or he might say this. Do you remember that you were dead? Do you realize, do you remember what I did for you? Do you remember why I did it? I left you there to bring me glory. And to make a difference in this world for me. Why didn't you do it? We can change now and forward. But when we get there, it's done. Let's change it now. Make him Lord today. Amen? Let's pray for